So what what do you think are the fundamental issues that face Canadians at the moment? What you you, you well, said I the country is, is in it, trouble in well, some I, ways and well, I think one is this national unity problem. I, I don't think particularly central Canada understands the depth of this Western alienation. Again. Yeah. And, and if you if you ever had a dual separatist movement, Quebec moving in that direction and the West moving at the same time, you, you'd tear the country apart. I, I don't think there's an appreciation by the Laurentian elites that that old model of Canada is not sufficient for the 21st century. So that and Canadians can never take national unity for granted. Our, our country's too big and too diverse to just hope it's going to hang together. So that that's one issue. The second is the fiscal issue. The, these astronomical deficits and debts, and no uh, even recognition that this could be a, a problem. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be talking today with Mr. Preston Manning, PCCCAOE. He's the founder of the Manning Foundation for Democratic Education and the Manning Center for Building Democracy, which seek to strengthen the knowledge, skills, principles, and ethical foundations of participants in Canada's political processes. Born in 1942, Preston Manning is the second son of longtime Alberta Premier Ernest C. Manning, who was also a prominent Christian layman and broadcaster. Growing up in a household which was both political and evangelical, he became intimately familiar with the political and religious experience of Western Canada. He has written and spoken extensively on navigating the faith political interface. He served as Member of Parliament from 93 to 2001 and founded two political parties, the Reform Party of Canada and the Canadian Reform Conservative Alliance, both of which became the official opposition in the Canadian Parliament and laid the foundation for the Conservative Party of Canada. He served as leader of the opposition from 97 to 2000 and was also his party's science and technology critic. In 2007, he was made a Companion of the Order of Canada and in 2013 was appointed to the Privy Council. Mr. Manning graduated from the University of Alberta with a BA in economics and provided consulting services to the energy industry for 20 years before entering the political arena. He has received honorary degrees from eight Canadian universities and is the author of three books, The New Canada, Think Big, and Faith, Leadership, and Public Life. He's currently working on a new book tentatively entitled Do Something. 365 Ways to Strengthen Democracy and Conservatism in Canada. Mr. Manning and his wife, Sandra, divide their time between Calgary, Alberta, and Vancouver, BC. They have five grown children and 12 grandchildren. Mr. Manning, it's really good to see you again. It's been a long time. It is, yeah. Good to see you, Jordan. Great to be with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We met originally. I asked you to come and speak to a group that I had hosted at the University of Toronto for a while, a group of intellectuals, and I was really interested in your experiences founding a political party because that's a very, very difficult thing to do and to bring it to fruition and to make it successful. And It became the second largest political party in Canada. Um, and so you were kind enough to share that entire experience with us. I remember at that point, there was enough divisiveness in Canada with regards to political issues that one of the attendees at that, uh, at that seminar was, there's about 30 of them, wouldn't attend. And so that was, you know, not so good, but <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting Understandable, talk. yes, yes. Well, it, and well, like the party I was involved in, it actually goes back to recognizing there's there's two parts of Canada that have third party traditions that that aren't don't regularly go back and forth between the traditional Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. One is Quebec, which has a whole third party tradition, the Bloc Québécois, the Party Québécois, the Rallyment de Crédits, goes back a long way. And then Western Canada has a tradition of producing new political parties, the old Progressive Party, the Farmers' Parties, the Depression Parties of the Canadian Commonwealth Federation and the uh, Social Credit Party. And then Reform, which we started, was part of the, uh, another attempt to advance Western Canadian uh, interest by the creation of a new political party. The, probably the lesson out of reform, I get asked that a long time, what, what's the biggest lesson? I, I, I don't think it's the, partic the particular 
uh, accomplishments of reform in an ideological or policy sense, but it's just the fact that, and I, I've been a great critic of Canadian democracy. I think Canadian democracy could be improved. But notwithstanding all its flaws, a small group of five people who met in a boardroom in Calgary in 1987 uh, and decided we don't like either of the current political options and we're going to do something different, we're able to take the tools that our democracy gives to everybody, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to try to persuade you to vote this way rather than that way, and we're able to create a new political party. Uh, we kept broadening it out, coalition building, et cetera, et cetera, creating that Canadian alliance. And then Stephen Harper and Peter McKay was the leader of the old Progressive Conservative Party in Canada, took it one more step and, and actually could, got to a minority government and then a majority government. The, the fact that you could still do that uh, under our democratic system and in the 20, uh, 21st century, uh, I think is... Uh, should be encouraging to people. If you don't like what's happening, you can change it. And a small group of people can change it using the tools that democracy gives to everybody. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions there. I mean, it seems to me that maybe Western Canada and Quebec have generated additional political parties, some of them more to the left than the traditional parties, and some of them more to the right, is because perhaps the West and Quebec have had the most uneasy relationship with Confederacy and so are prone now and then to, to generate new political forms. So do you think that's a reasonable analysis or there's there something else going on? Well, well I, I think it is. And, uh, you know, Canada is a huge country, you know, the second largest country by land mass in the world, and it has distinctive regional uh, differences and diversity, not, not just geographic, but demographically in every other way. And so it's not surprising that that should be the case. W one of the things I point out in my most recent book is, is actually out now, this Do Something for uh, 365 Ways to Strengthen uh, Canada. I point out to my Quebec friends, and this can often be misunderstood, that in the long run, Quebec is going to have to find an ally somewhere else in, in Canada than just relying on getting its influence with the federal government. And I have a graph that shows the percentage of French speakers versus English speakers going down, the percentage of Quebec population in relation to total Canadian population going down, uh, Quebec uh, proportion of the GDP in relation to the Canadian GDP going down. And I say, well, what that suggests, and I, I say this to my Quebec friends, you're going to have to find an ally in somewhere else in the country, not just in Ottawa, to, to advance your interests. And a place you couldn't find them, and this always surprised them because they think the West is anti-Quebec. Uh, I say, you could find them in the West because what we want and you want is a more decentralized federation. You, you want a more decentralized federation for uh, social, cultural, linguistic reasons. The West wants it for economic reasons, but the common ground is a more decentralized federation. Now, now whether that unholy alliance between <laughs> Quebec and the West would ever occur, I, I don't know. When, when we got to Ottawa, like we got to Ottawa in 1993, in the 1993 election, uh, Reform got 52 members, from all from Western Canada, except one from Ontario. And Quebec, the, the Bloc Quebecois got 54 members, just two members different. Uh, another aside there, we lost three seats in Edmonton by 320 votes. Uh, if, if, if we had got those three seats, uh, a Federalist Party would have been the official opposition in the 1993 Parliament instead of a Separatist Parliament. Mm -hmm. And if the country had ever blown apart because the Separatists won the referendum in Quebec, I was going to go back to Edmonton and say there's 325 people here who, because they didn't vote. Don't think your vote doesn't make a difference. Yeah, well, you, made, you made two points there. You know, one is that important decisions can be swayed by a very tiny number of people from time to time. And, and also, and this is one of the things I thought was particularly fascinating about what you did, is that the democratic processes are sufficiently permeable so that you can modify them substantially with, with considerable work, but with a, a small number of people. Oh, so. yes, yes. And, and, and just to finish the Quebec uh, West connection, when we got there, we, we put on a breakfast for the bloc. We, we got 100 new members, over 100 new members in the parliament, a huge turnover, none of whom knew each other. So I, I got a hold of Lucien Bouchard, the leader of the 
the Bloc Quebec well, I said, we ought to get together, you know, and we'll have a breakfast. We'll put on a breakfast. We'll bring the pancake from the West. You bring the maple syrup from Quebec and we'll have a <laughs> get to go. Uh, and we did. I got up and gave a speech and said, we're the bunch from Western Canada. They're discontented with how the Federation is working right now. And we want to fix it. We want to change it. We want to reform it. And Lucien got up and said, we're a bunch from Quebec who are not happy with Confederation and we want to get out. <laughs> And that's where we, that's where we ended up. Anyway, that's sort of a aside on the, but, but the, the other dimension of uh, Western Canadian politics, and this is very relevant to some of the subjects you've discussed, is there is no region of North America that has had more experience with populist movements, populist parties, and populist governments than Western Canada. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. The old progressive party, uh, which was uh, like the progressives in the United States in some respect, uh, was basically a Western-based bottom-up, not top-down party. The farmers' parties that governed in Alberta, governed in Manitoba, briefly governed in Ontario, were bottom-up populist parties. The, 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 both the Depression parties, the CCF, the Socialist Party, was a bottom-up party. Social credit in Alberta was a bottom-up party. And reform, in many respects, too, was one of those populist parties. So the West had, had a lot of experience, not, not just with populist movements and, and not just populist parties, populist governments that actually got into power. And I think there's lessons to be learned from that with the populist movements of today and how you respond to them and how you lead them and how you handle them. So how would you define a populist movement? And, and do you think the fact that that was able to find expression in the West continually was an advantage or a disadvantage? And I suppose well, it's well, well, there's two questions there. Well, for, first of all, I, I define it as a bottom up rather than a top down political movement, but a lot of grassroots support and agitation rather than something coming down from the top. The, the, the other way I define it is populist parties and governments are almost always a product of the previous administrations, that, the administrations that preceded it. I see Trump is the legacy of, the, of Obama. G uh, Doug Ford is the legacy of Kathleen Wynne in Ontario, because you have an administration, a party before, that gets support from a lot of people, usually from the elites, but a lot of other people as well. But it progressively loses contact and, and support with 50% of the population. And if it does that long enough, it will generate a populist movement. So populist movements are very much a product of what was there before and whether it accepted or alienated uh, large chunks of the population. So do you, is that something that you see as a positive force altogether? Because well, uh, populism uh, most uh, often gets a bad name. Yeah, well, I'd come at that, for, again, Western Canada's experience is, I mean, populist movements have their wild side, and they can have their extreme side, and they can be dangerous. But I would argue they also have a positive uh, potential. And just, again, take the Western Canadian experience. The, the first woman elected to the federal parliament was Agnes Campbell MacPhail. How did she get there? She did not get there through the Liberal Party. She did not get there through the Conservative Party. In fact, they bitterly fought her election in, in every election she contested. She got there through the old Progressive Party, the bottom-up party. The, the, the famous five, the so-called famous Alberta Five that got women recognized as persons uh, uh, under Canadian law, four out of the five of those were members of populist movements and populist governments. So this is an accomplishment, the recognition of women as persons, the achievement of women getting elected to the legislation of the parliament was a populist achievement, not an establishment achievement. And then the Depression parties, the CCF, the Socialist Party, whom I don't agree with, but one of their accomplishments was to get Canadian Medicare. Whether you agree with that or not, most people think that was a progressive development. You can argue about how it's done and what needs to be done in the future. But that came through a bottom-up provincial populist party. And in Alberta, the social credit regime, one of the big worries if you're the government and the party in power in a region that gets an oil boom is the danger of corruption. It happened in Texas, it happened in Oklahoma, it happened in Louisiana, it happened in California, it happened in Alaska. The, the federal administration of Warren G. Harding was brought down by a corruption through the oil patch. Somebody tried to bribe a, a federal cabinet minister in order to get drilling rights in a federal park. It almost it 
discredited the Warren administration. Uh, and one of the great fears in Alberta was, OK, we had this oil boom in 1947, and when my father was the premier then, was how do you keep that from corrupting uh, the, the people in power? And it was a populist party that managed to not get corrupted. Uh, in now, I remember when you, I remember you speaking about beginning your political party, you you told me, correct me if I'm wrong, but you told me that you went from town to town, from city to city across Western Canada, and you you had a speech or a variety of speeches that you gave, but that you were most um, involved in some sense with the question and answer sessions, and oh, that, yeah. that enabled you to sample what people were thinking about, what their concerns were, and to weave that into policy. So that became part of a discussion between an emergent political party and, and the constituents. Oh, yeah. And I think that's a distinguishing feature of uh, populist parties. It's a receiver-oriented form of communication, where, where you start not by what do I want to say to these people and what do I want them. You start with who are these people? What, what are they concerned about? Why are they here? Why is that lady in the third row who's probably got kids at home and had to make arrangements? To come? What on earth is she doing at this political meeting? How would she say what I want to say to them if she was ex trying to explain it to her friends next door? And, and I, used to, uh, I used to get a lot of, uh, I would hang around after the meeting, and not just for the purpose of shaking hands and how are you and please vote for me. Uh, listen hard to what people were saying to you. And eventually they'll try to say back to you what they thought you were saying to them. Right, right. Uh, I'd say my, my father became premier in 1943 when I was one year old, and he was premier for 25 years before he resigned undefeated 25 years later. So I spent my entire life in a political home. And uh, in the 1960s, John Diefenbaker, who was campaigning to be prime minister, became prime minister, came, there was a couple of elections in the 60s, and he came through Edmonton and Calgary, where uh, we lived. And my father said, you should go and listen to John. And he said, watch particularly what he does in the first five or six minutes of his talk. So I went to the Edmonton Jubilee Auditorium. We used to come to the Jubilee Auditorium. By the time I got there, it was packed full of people. You couldn't find a place to seat. But they were seating the media on the stage behind them. So I pretended I was a media person. I ended up sitting about 20 feet behind them. And I watched the first five or six minutes. He had a big loose leaf book on the podium. And he kind of kept flipping it. And, and saying a little bit about that, a little bit about this, looking this mm. way, looking that way, looking in the balcony like that. And it, it didn't seem to make any rhyme or reason as to what he was saying, why, and in that direction. Then all of a sudden he stopped that and he honed in on three things, bing, bang, boom. Mm. And that was the theme of his talk. And what my father said afterwards, what he's doing, in that he, Redeven Baker was a defense lawyer, very experienced in reading juries. What he's doing, he's like a bat. He's sending out signals sure. and watch, watching what bounces back. And then he gets a reading of where the audience is at. Why did that guy go like this? Why did and that so guy... then what would he start? Was he speaking without notes from then on in? Well, yeah, he was very polished by that time. Well, he had some notes there, but I don't think he really needed them. But I think this, again, this business of trying to read your audience. When I was in the consulting business, we actually developed a, uh, a questionnaire for receiver-oriented communication. What do you have to, questions do you ask? Who are these people? What do they believe? How would they say? What's their vocabulary? What's their conceptual framework? And then given that, okay, given that, now how do I frame my message? What do I say in order to get to them? And, you know, I know uh, when I was lecturing constantly to large crowds, you know, I was always watching individuals within the crowd. I never yeah. spoke to the crowd as a whole. I would pick people and talk to them for 15 seconds or so, and then pick someone else. And by looking at individuals, I could tell if people were following what I was saying, and yep, I could yep. turn the lecture into a conversation. I mean, they weren't speaking, but I got all the nonverbal cues. And yep. if you use notes or a prepared talk, you obliterate that relationship with the audience. Oh, yeah. And if, if you can meet with people after and say, I used to do that and listen to them, it, it would affect how my next presentation. One of the classics on that was in the when Canada got into this uh, during the Mulroney government years, into constitutional reform was what was required to unite the country. And there was this uh, constitutional, Charlottetown constitutional accord that was negotiated between the federal government, and the provincial governments. They all agreed on it. This would solve our unity problems, particularly the difficulties with Quebec. 
And uh, I had a long, legalistic, dry speech on why all the previous attempts to unite the country through constitutional change had usually failed for a bunch of reasons. Yes, often disastrously. Yes, but it was dry and dull and legalistic. You put your, I even put my wife to sleep, let alone the audience. Uh, but after one of these meetings where I, I did that, uh, I was talking to this fella, and he said, uh, you know, he's trying to say to me something along the lines. He says, we're, we're like kids in the back of the car, he says. And we're trying to get to this place called national unity. And uh, all we're saying is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We're kids in the back of the car. We want to get there, but are we there yet? Are we on the right road? Well, so I reframed my whole speech. I said, you know, Pierre Trudeau said uh, national unity was over near new constitutional drive. And we let him drive the car and he's giving people the finger out the window and Rennie Levesque's in the back saying he's going to be sick if we don't let him out. And then we let Joe Clark drive the car, but Joe forgot to put gas in it. We didn't go very far. And then now Brian Maloney says it's over near some lake called Meech Lake. And now he says it's over near Charlotte. And we're just saying, are we there? I, I could carry the whole... 45 minute history of Canada's attempt to get national unity through constitutional change by using a simple analogy suggested to me by a guy after the meeting, trying to say the way he would say to his friends what I was trying to say to him. And, and I've had that experience, the, what was the 2002, uh, 2002 federal election. My riding was Calgary Southwest in, in, in Calgary. And I used to ride the C train uh, and I'd start a conversation in the C train because these are my constituents. And then I'd get off and they'd be arguing about something. And so on the day the election was called, this was called by the Gretchen government, there was a sponsorship scandal that was floating around. I was sitting beside a fellow, looked like he was a carpenter because he was covered with sawdust and he had a toolkit. And I said to him, have you heard they called a, a, a federal election today? He said, yeah, we heard that. And I said, uh, some of the commentators say that that scandal, that sponsorship scandal, corruption thing in Quebec is going to be a big issue. Uh, do you know anything about that? Do you care about that? And he didn't answer anything. By now, the ears are perking up in the car. And, and I thought maybe he's tuning me out. And he says, well, he says, it's like there's something rotten in the fridge, he said. And we got to decide whether it's just the cheese or the yogurt or whether we got to clean out the whole damn thing. <laughs> well, by golly, that night I had to give a partisan speech and guess what my analogy was? You know, simple, easy to understand. It, it smells like there's something rotten in the fridge and we got to decide what to do about it. So I was talking to C Congressman Dan Crenshaw yesterday okay. about populism in the United States. And, and no, he, he said that his observation was that the dangerous form of populism emerges when leaders tell the audience what they think they want to hear, or there's a, there's a form of manipulation going on. But the, what struck me about what you told me years ago about what you did when you created the Reform Party was that there was a tremendous amount, not so much of telling the audience what they wanted to hear for your purposes, but listening to them so that you could extract out policy that actually addressed people's concerns. Yes, yes. And, and we used to use the relief well analogy. Okay, I come from Alberta where the oil patch analogies are quite, <laughs> quite common. And in, in the oil patch, there's such a thing as a wildcat well that's drilled into a, a, a formation where you don't know what's down below. And then there's such a thing as a rogue well that hits a pocket of oil or gas under enormous pressure. It can be very dangerous. It blows the, uh, the drilling platform off the wellhead. It can catch fire. In 1940, uh, Eight, a year after the Duke discovery, when they still didn't know the extent of the field, there was a, the Atlantic number three blew out south of Edmonton. It, it, it released more oil, 10 times the amount of oil than the Exxon Valdez in about four days. I mean, these are huge, uh, uh, can be catastrophic. <clears throat> but one of the ways of dealing with a rogue well is you drill in a relief well from the side. And the angle got to be right. If it's too shallow, it won't take off enough pressure. If it's too deep, it can turn into a rogue well. But if it's just right, it can take off enough pressure that they can install valves, bring that very valuable energy under control and for useful purposes. So and a particularly a useful metaphor for, for talking to people in Western Canada. Well, you were oh, also dealing with Western separatism at that time and in oh, some sure. sense trying to cut it off at to cut, cut it, head it off at the pass, yes. another Western metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that, this, this is what the relief well does. Now, now, the reform was a relief well, and you had to tap in 
to the discontent that was generating this. So you had to identify with it. You had to connect to it. But then instead of saying, let's set fire to something or let's blow the uh, lid off the government in Ottawa, we, we said, let, let's make some changes that will, let's use this energy for some constructive purpose. And we developed that uh, slogan, the West wants in, not out, but it wants in on these kind of conditions. And and I, I think that's the way you deal with uh, with populism is you... Uh, you, you have to identify with what's at the roots and you have to get close to it. So you sound a little bit like them when you're doing that. And that's what the outside commentators would say, well, you're just another version of them. No, you're identifying with it so that you can channel it into something constructive. For our American friends, I'm a great admirer of, uh, uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson and his declaration, his contributions, Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution. But in, in around 1820, and he must have been, he's an old man by then, uh, he was asked by some colleague, if you were redoing the, Canadian, the American Constitution, would, where would you still vest the ultimate powers of society? And he said this, I, I, I would vest the ultimate powers of society in the people themselves. And then anticipating the objection to that, but the people themselves, are, they're not educated enough. They'll go chasing after some wild man. He was saying this when Andrew Jackson was already on the, on the political scene, a wild guy from the South, not a Virginian. He would have been the Trump of his day. And here's Jefferson, the patriarchal guy from <laughs> Virginia, author of the Constitution. He, he, he's saying this with that in mind. He says, and if you think them, the people, not fit to exercise self-government with a wholesome discretion. The remedy is not to take self-government from them, but to inform their discretion. That, that is a very profound statement. And I'd say that to our American friends that are worried about where populism can lead, particularly depending on who the leaders are. Well, One you're way. also making a case for a, a, a relationship between dangerous population, po populism and repressed resentment in some sense. So yes. Yes. The, the idea that you're putting forward is that, well, any group of policies in some sense is going to generate a counter position. And that counter position can become increasingly alienated and resentful until their fundamental goal is something like drain the swamp or tear the whole thing down or et cetera, et cetera. And so communicating with those people before it comes to that and trying to channel that into something that's hypothetically productive within the system is obviously one of the ways the system maintains itself. And Canada has maintained its democracy for a very long time by, by world standards. I mean, oh, everyone yeah. thinks yeah. in some sense we're a new country, but that's only true in some ways. Well, and this, there's a, way, a new wave of Western alienation uh, like what we face in the, in the late 1980s and 1993. The, uh, and you can identify what is it that these Westerners are, are concerned about, and then you can try to come up with what's an answer to that. Uh, one of the things is just inequality. The West has always been strong on equality. When it, uh, Western provinces were created, they were not created equal with Ontario and the Atlantic provinces and Quebec. They were denied control of their natural resources which was retained by the federal government, which became a huge ca cause of resentment. And then finally, they got control of their natural resources in 1930, mainly because of a, a progressive group in the federal parliament, not federal liberals or conservatives, who allied with the government of Alberta at that time and got a constitutional amendment. But the equality, equality, equality. And, and right now, the West complains on the equalization formula. Alberta's contributed whatever it is, $500, $600 billion into the federal treasury and to the province, other provinces. Alberta gets into financial trouble and there's nothing coming back. And people say, that's not fair. That's not equal. The whole carbon price, um, carbon taxing issue. Albertans say, okay, the rationale behind that is you're saying that if the development of a particular type of energy, in this case, hydrocarbons, has negative environmental effects, what we should do is identify those negative environmental effects, figure out what has to be done to avoid or mitigate them. And we ought to include the cost of that avoidance or mitigation in the price of the product, either through a tax or through a pricing regime or whatever. Isn't that the rationale? And you can say that to public audiences in Central Canada, Quebec, Atlantic Canada say, yeah, that's right. Okay, but Westerners say, okay, if you're going to internalize the environmental externalities of production of energy from hydrocarbons, why don't you do it for every other energy source? 
Sure, the hydro guys don't produce a lot of CO2, except in the amount of, of concrete that they use. But they have flooded carbon sinks in Canada the size of Lake Ontario. So where's the reservoir tax for those guys if you're going to internalize? The nuclear people don't produce a lot of uh, CO2, but they produce one of the deadliest poisons known to man, on which this country has spent billions trying to figure out what do you do with it afterwards. So where's the radiation tax for those guys? You, let's treat every. So why do you think? Why do you think that inequality of of internalizing externalized costs exists? Because it is peculiar. If if it was driven purely by environmental concerns, I mean, you might say it's it's hyper concern over carbon per se, but that doesn't account for not paying attention to the externalized well, costs well, of hydro. One of the one of the reasons, and maybe I'm being a little political here, it's one thing to penalize uh, the population of Alberta through a, a carbon tax. It's another thing to establish a reservoir tax for Quebec hydro. Politically, if you were the federal government, now that would be a big challenge. Yeah, well, uh, and it's also, you know, hydro has got a reputation, like a low resolution re reputation for being clean, whereas yeah. Alberta yeah suffers from this, you know, it's tarred and feathers, so to speak, <laughs> with the oil sands. Yeah. And so that's a very difficult battle to fight. I mean, yeah. the Keystone cancellation seemed to be a reflection of that. Yeah. And in, in the end of the day, and I'm not saying at the end of the day that hydro might not, all costs in might still be more uh, effective, both environmentally and energy wise than hydrocarbons or, or solar or, or wind. But the difference will not be between black and white between zero and a thousand. The difference between uh, hydrocarbon energy and, and, uh, and hydro energy will be between 600 and 700. And, and eventually, eventually this is going to catch up. I, I, I raise this with economists. I say, how, how can you argue about the merit of internalizing the negative environmental consequences of one form of energy and not to be consistent, argue for it for every other form of energy. And they say, yeah, that's, that's right. But I don't want to lead that crusade. Sooner or later, it'll happen. And these consumers that have been told that, that, that this form of energy is cheaper and better environment are going to find out it's not quite what they've been told. But it's, it, we got onto this, basically, this is this Western passion for e equality, and you can apply it in that area to the equalization. Well, and also the Western dependence, especially in Alberta, but also Saskatchewan to some degree, dependence oh, yeah. on the oil oh, patch yeah. and for, oh, for its yeah. whole economic yeah. function. Yeah. yeah. And then, then this freedom, like a lot of the people that populated the West came there for, for freedom from either tradition or for authoritarian regimes and that sort of thing, this freedom, freedom, freedom. And, and that's a, a big thing with a, a lot of the Westerners, including a lot of the new Canadians, not, not just the old uh, pioneers. But uh, so they, they attach a lot of importance to those freedoms that are in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which in their view existed long before the Charter, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of uh, belief, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. They, they have always blessed and believed in free trade, freedom of trade. Uh, and, and opposed the tariffs and, and protective uh, me measures. They want to see domestic free trade. They say, how come we can negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States and we have these barriers between trade, uh, between provinces? Uh, want freedom of trade, freedom of choice in social services. Why, why do we just have to have a semi-monopolistic position in the health sector, in the education sector, in the social services sector? Why can't we have a mixed system, public, private, charitable, and we get freedom to choose where we get our social services? This freedom, 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 freedom. And, and anything that restricts that, including even the current restrictions due to COVID rub people the wrong way. They, uh, they, they, they want to see balance between, okay, we, we got to have health protection, but what's the impact of that on my civil rights and freedoms? And where's the balance between protecting my health and protecting my civil liberties? Where's the balance between uh, protecting the environment and protecting the economy on which my income depends? These are all, uh, and I, I think if Canada gets into a federal election, which it's predicted it will fairly soon, uh, a lot of these political party people, no matter what party, conservatives, liberal, green, socialist, whatever, when they knock on the door, an uh, increasing number of people are saying, I want to know where you and your party stand on equalization. I want to know where you stand on freedom of civil liberties when they're threatened by whatever. I want to know whether you believe in economic impact assessments of environmental measures 
not just environmental impact assessments of economic measures. I want to know where you stand on domestic free trade. And if, if you can answer those questions, which are fueling this bottom-up discontent, you, you can channel it into a constructive uh, result. If you have no answer to it, or you ignore them, or you don't know what they're talking about, to listen to Justin Trudeau's speeches, you, you wouldn't get the idea. It's the faintest idea that this is out there. <laughs> it needs to be answered. You're going to see more of this uh, Western alienation. And in fact, one question I have for you, Jordan, given your professional background, like, are, are there psychological roots to uh, what, what a portion of the population is alienated, feels alienated, left out? I, I have an email from a young guy, just a young guy, saying, I don't feel at home in my own country, and I'm leaving. He didn't even know where he's going, but I'm not staying here. I don't feel at home. Is there a psychological dimension to alienation, and is there a prescription for how you deal with it, other than what the person says is alienating? <laughs> well, it's a, good, it's a good thing for us to discuss, because it does seem to me, although I wouldn't say it's precisely psychological, I think it might have more to do with education, like, it yeah, seems right. to me that most young people, and perhaps most citizens of Canada, and this might go for other democracies as well, believe that there is very little they can do about the state of affairs within traditional political systems. And my experience with traditional political systems hasn't been that that's the case. They're generally screaming out for people to participate and desperate for it. So that's true at the party level. It's true at virtually every level. And so it's not like the institutions are particularly opaque. I mean, you can't just suddenly become prime minister, obviously, um, but there, there's plenty of room for participation in the political process. And it isn't clear to me that our citizens really know that or believe it. Yeah, well, that's why I try to tell people that reform story, whether you agree with what reform was trying to achieve, the, the fact that a small number of people could start something that ended up uh, ultimately with all kinds of changes and zigzags and reversals and forward moves for, forming a government. Uh, this not only happened in the West, if, if, in Lester Pearson's day when he was prime minister, there was a meeting of three or four guys in Montreal, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Gerard Peltier, uh, Jean Marchand, and... Uh, with the blessing of Pearson, they decided we're going to make the Liberal Party an instrument to advance Quebec's interests. Just three guys. <laughs> they called them the three wise men from the West and, or the East. And by golly, they, they did it. So uh, maybe if more Canadians knew our, our, our story that this, our system does lend itself to, to change if you'll get involved. But one of the things I advocate in this book of mine Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but I, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of political speeches over the years, and a lot of them, including many of my own, deserve to be forgotten. <laughs> but uh, one that sticks in my mind comes way back when I, I first ran for parliament in, in the 60s uh, um, in Edmonton East, which was a multicultural riding, long before Toronto discovered the virtues of multiculturalism. And uh, I, I was invited to a meeting of the Latvian society to celebrate their brief period of independence between the wars. And they had a speaker there. I think her name was Dr. Anna Radovics. And she gave this speech on the uh, three great commandments of Western civilization. The first one was know thyself from Socrates and the Greek tradition. The second one was control thyself from the Hebrew lawgivers and the Roman lawgivers. And the third was give yourself from Jesus mm -hmm. of Nazareth. And, and she elaborated. And on that first point on know yourself, like know your country, know your people, know, and talking to politicians, know your constituents, know the people you're supposed to be representing. And uh, in the U S if you want, if you want to run for the Republicans or Democrats, they can give you a huge book. It's about five, each of them about 500 pages long, giving the complete description of the history of the democratic party. I forget the name of it. And then there's another one for the Republicans. in Canada. There is no definitive history of the liberal party and the liberal tradition in Canada. There's no complete definitive history of the conservative tradition. There's so no what, why do you think it is that the Americans are so much better at myth-making and storytelling and history-building than Canadians? I mean, well, they're I, phenomenally I, good at it. I don't know. We, we, have, we have people that are capable of doing it. We have historians that are as capable of doing that as the Americans, but we haven't done it. And one of my challenges in my book is somewhere out there, there's got to be some historians who can produce those four books, the liberal one, the conservative one, 
the socialist one and the third party traditions, because you can't cover Quebec and Western politics without the third party tradition. And, and th that would be enormously helpful in knowing ourselves. And you think and, a university and, might be interested in doing that? Well, I think you could find the funding for it. I think you could find the funding for it. And it's part of knowing yourself. No, I, I use the... Uh, the broad jump analogy. In the Olympics, there used to be a, an event called the standing broad jump, where you, how far could you jump from a standing position? And the, the record was, I don't know, eight feet or something. It was quite phenomenal. But then there's the running broad jump, where the record is 27 or 28 feet or whatever it is. In other words, you can get ahead further if you get a run at it than if you start just from standing still. And I, I say that to people wanting to get into political office. There's a whole history behind all of this. Get, get a run at it by knowing the background, the history, and so forth, and you'll get further than thinking politics just started the day you've discovered it and you do it from a standing start. Uh, and now, a cynic, with regards to your involvement in, in, in the political process, a cynic might say, well, you were born into a political family, and I presume that that also enabled you to avail yourself of a variety of connections, and so and, and also produces within you a kind of deep knowledge that would be a consequence of being within a family like that. I mean, so to what degree do you think your specialized family background, say, played, played a determining role in your success and your ability oh, oh, to do oh, this? Oh, I, I think it did. My father had a um, huge influence on me in that connection. But I would generalize from that experience. There's a lot more can be said on that than just family background. Uh, we, we, you mentioned in my biography, we have 12 grandchildren. We actually have 13 now. And uh, a number of them are boys who play hockey and a couple of them at very high level. So we, my wife and I have been to an infinite number of hockey games, kids games. Uh, and uh, when they're about 11 or 12, you go to the arena at seven o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, there's nobody there except the parents and the players. But if you look on the back row, you look on the back row of that arena, there's a couple of guys with clipboards. Who, who are those guys? They're scouts. They're scouts, some of them with NHL connections, scouting 11 and 12 year olds, trying to find somebody that maybe has the talent to play the national game at the national level. Now, where's the political equivalent of that? If, if we want to improve the quality of democracy or the quality of your political party, in my case, the Conservative Party, where's the scouts that are out there trying to find people, not, not the day before they want to run for office, 10 years before, so that you can give them some experience, give them some of the training that I got at, at home, but other people can get through training programs. And I, I use this, uh, uh, another analogy, the, the political watering hole analogy. Think of our House of Commons or the provincial legislature as a watering hole in the middle of the political jungle to which thirsty political animals gravitate. <laughs> There are only certain paths that get to the watering hole. One of them is the family path. You had a family that was interested and involved in politics, and so you are, and you can come to that. That's only one path. I, I came by that uh, path. Uh, Justin Trudeau came by that path. There's a lot of people come by that path. But there's other paths. There's the constituency path. You, you join a political party. You work in the constituency association. You become the vice president. You become the president. The member of parliament decides to retire. And you say, I, you know, I could do that. And, and so you, you get to parliament or the legislature through the constituency path. Uh, Chris Warkenton, a member from Peace River. I think you, that's isn't Fairview in Peace River, your hometown. <laughs> Chris was a, not, the head of his constituency association when he was 19 years of age. And Charlie Penson was a member of parliament. And Chris found out what it was all about. And Chris ended up, when Charlie retired, becoming the, 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 the member of parliament. There's the civil service route. Mackenzie King uh, was a civil servant who observed a lot of cabinet ministers and that said, I can do what they're doing better than they're doing. Lester Pearson was a civil servant. He got to the watering hole through the civil service routes. There's the advocacy group. Uh, and if you would trace these paths, there's six or seven of them to the watering hole. If you can catch the thirsty political animal up way upstream, if he's a hundred yards from the watering hole. He can smell the water. She can smell the water. I got there this far. I don't need any help. I don't need any training. But if you catch them through your recruitment and, and scouting system, if you catch them upstream, you then you can provide the training and the background so that when they arrive there, they are better qualified to be a small D Democrat or to be a liberal or a conservative or whatever party affiliation than if they never there was no training or preparation until they were within 100 yards of the watering hole.
I don't know if that analogy uh, holds. And and when I got out of Parliament, or Sandra says I should, I sound like I was in the penitentiary when I <laughs> left the Parliament. I uh, one of the last things I did, I interviewed the Speaker and the clerk of the House of Commons and each of the provincial legislatures and a couple of the territorial ones. And I asked them, I said, you have seen hundreds and hundreds of elected people come through here and you've seen the state of preparedness or unpreparedness of them. If you could prescribe courses uh, to be given to those people so that they're, they enter prepared. And this is what Cicero wrote in his diary. You want to get in the Roman Senate, intrate parity, enter prepared. The guy took 10 years preparation. He was an ambitious son of a guy. Uh, and so they gave me this list. It's in my Do Something book of about 30 different things, all the way from uh, protocol to, to uh, um, the, the committee procedures to lawmaking. Some of them pointed out, you, 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 to become a barista at Starbucks, you, you need 10 to 15 hours training to know the difference between a mocha and a latte, latte. but you can become a lawmaker in the Parliament of Canada or in a legislature with one without one hour of training in lawmaking. So they gave me this long list. And I uh, eventually I took it to uh, Carleton University. Dr. Rosanna Runta was the president at that time and said, look, Carleton is in Ottawa. Can, can you not put together a graduate course to, to provide some of this training for, you know, a prospective members of parliament, but for legislative assistants, executive assistants, people in the political side who might become members. And she, she picked up the ball and uh, uh, they ended up creating this Riddell graduate program in political management. Clay Riddell who was an oil patch guy in Calgary. She came out to see him and she said, we're going to, we'd like to present this program. We want some money from you. Oh, and she said, it'll be nonpartisan because we can't be in anybody's pocket. So Clay said to her, and, and for which nonpartisan legislature or House of Commons are you preparing me? I mean, what she meant was, oh, can't be in any party's politics, but he persuaded her to call it cross-partisan. You, you don't want to be in anybody's pocket, but you're going to cover all the parties. So that, that program is still running, but it's a drop in the bucket. And then uh, at UBC, there's this Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions uh, under Max Cameron and, and Professor Baird. And... Uh, uh, they have an institute for future legislatures. They, they took five or six of those things from that list, and they, they put on a summer school for people that want to get into politics. They're working on a project to create Democracy House, a, a hundred-seat replica of the House of Commons with all the trimmings and all the rooms and all the rest for would-be people for training. And uh, I, I know I'm rambling on and on, but I, I just think this, uh, this necessity of preparing elected people better for public office when they get there is an enormously important investment. And, and we don't make that investment the way we could or we should. What has the Manning Center for Democracy been doing? Well, I'm actually retired from that. Well, we, we were doing that. We, we were doing, trying to provide some of that training, putting on courses and putting on conferences. Uh, one of the weaknesses on the conservative side, it's a congenital weakness of conservatives, perhaps because they tend to be entrepreneurial and independent. They operate in silos. The, the, the conservative think tanks do, do not do a lot together. They're a little bit afraid of losing donors to the other think tank. The advocacy groups, they don't do a lot together. They, and sometimes they'll plan advocacy campaigns almost on the same time period in the same place when it ought to be uh, coordinated. So we put on these conferences and these networking events to try to get the different components of the conservative movement to at least know what each other do. The provincial political parties do very little in cooperation with each other and very little in cooperation with the federal party. So networking and conferencing, but not just conferencing for the sake of talking, conferencing for the sake of building relationships was one of our big uh, objectives. And uh, at, when I retired and uh, just a, a year ago, we handed that function off to another group that's always been sympathetic to us called the Canada Strong and Free Network. It's headed up by Troy Lanigan, who was a longtime president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. And Troy's carrying on that same function that the Manning Center did, the conferencing and the networking function that's on the conservative side. The, the other thing, one of the other things we, we, we did we detected, and you raised this with me in, a, in an email, the, what do you do to the, for these younger people that are disillusioned with the whole 
uh, process, politicians, parliament. Uh, you know, I've heard young people say, I wouldn't care if they shut the parliament down for five years. What difference does it make? And uh, one of the problems with them is they do not identify with this left, right, center conceptualization of the political arena. Uh, and it's a good question. I've had them ask me, how come the political arena is divided up in accordance with the seating arrangement after the French Revolution, when the, the landlords, the lords and that sat on the right and the, the workers guys sat on the left. That's where that left, right, center comes from. So why, why are we still using that? So we put on these receptions for millennials. And when they came in the door, we had a bunch of posters around the room with different conceptual framers, not, not the traditional left, right, center, at least not that labeling. We had a democratic conceptual framework. Uh, are, do you favor lar consultation with large numbers of people on public decisions and giving them a role in decision making? Or do you favor more expert opinion and small group deciding what's best and communicate? Where are you on that axis? We give them stickers, put yourself on that axis. We had an environmental axis. Do you think environmental protection should be done essentially by government regulation, taxation, government initiatives? Or do you think there's a role for market mechanisms and entrepreneurial? In a way, this has got a left-right dimension to it, but it's not quite as obvious and not stated in those terms. And we had a 15 or 16 of these alternative conceptual frameworks. And interestingly enough, uh, they, they were a lot more interested in discussing and debating and, and placing themselves in that conceptual framework. And if we had just had the old left, right, center, where they say, well, like, I'm sort of a little bit on the left on the social, I'm a little bit on the right on economic, and, you know, I guess I'm in the center. And like, you know, it's a, a very uninspiring discussion. So that, that's the second thing, I think, that besides training is find conceptual frameworks that pe people can relate to and, and conduct your politics in that, uh, in that uh, framework. The, on the communication side of that, too, uh, I keep coming back to communications because modern communication, uh, politics is so much communications. This uh, uh, Asking this question, out of whose mouth would this message be most credible? And, and this is a hard thing for politicians to ask because often your communications guy will say, not yours. <laughs> you know, pe people don't respect political people today. So can you find someone else to say that who actually believes it that would be more credible with the uh, audience. And uh, a great illustration of this, again, when I was a kid, my, my father gave me a long playing record by Edward R. Murrow. Does that name you would ring a bell? <laughs> uh, it was called, I Can Hear It Now, and it was extracts from famous speeches. And it, uh, it had a, a speech by Woodrow Wilson after the First World War. He's trying to convince Americans to support the League of Nations which they were not too inclined to support. But his speech went like this. Uh, uh, oh yeah, mothers who have lost their sons in France have come to me and have taken my hand and said, God bless you, Mr. President. I advise the Congress of the United States to create the situation that led to the deaths of their sons. My fellow citizens, would they pray God to bless me? because they believed that their boys died for something which vastly transcended the immediate objects of the war. They believed, they believed, they believed. Now, what he's saying is what he believes, but he's put it in the mouths of mothers who had lost their sons in France. This, if, if you can't actually get someone else to say what you want to, to say that is more credible, at least you could do it through that transference message in the speech. And... Uh, uh, again, th these are techniques that can be taught and, and practiced in a way that then inspires more participation. People can relate to it, you know, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done to do that. Well, you wrote this entire book recently on ways to participate and ways to improve democracy. What Can you step us through that to, to, a, to a greater degree? What, when you look at the, the de democratic processes in Canada and perhaps in the West in general, what, what, what else do you see that needs to be improved and how? Well, I, I would almost come back to some of the things I've said already. Re recruiting better people, into, and I, I know that's being <laughs> pejorative, but recruiting b better pe people who've got some other reason than self-interest to get into the political, a recruitment system, a scouting system. How can we have a scouting system for the NHL and we can't have it for the <laughs> Parliament of Canada, the legislature? Recruiting people. 
And, and you have to deal with their objections. I, I've been involved in candidate recruitment my entire uh, life. And, and the, the biggest single reason given now for not being involved is people, very good people, competent people, people make a contribution say, I will not subject myself and my family to the abuse that I'm going to get, particularly through the media and the social media. So you have to address those types of questions. And then I say, okay, you got recruitment, then, then training, preparation. I have a list of 20 questions a lawmaker should have ask. Uh, and it, this, these are not, we're not talking like a lawyer about the law. We're talking about a, a law, someone who makes a law is different than a lawyer. Uh, and there's certain questions that got to be asked about a, a, a bill. What's the story behind it? You make a big point in your, uh, in your recent book about the importance of stories. What's the story behind the, wh why is this here? Sh should this parliament even be considering this? Uh, does the bill state the purpose of the of the law of the law you're trying to pass, and does it state it in the bill, not in the pro preamble? Because our courts have dismissed declarations of purpose that are in the pre preamble; they can't dismiss it within the bill. There's a whole bunch of what's the social impact of this? What's the economic impact? What's the administrative cost of this? There's about 20 questions you should ask about if you're going to be a lawmaker. That, but that, that's not that's not taught. But so the recruitment, the training. Uh, and, and then a big emphasis on this communication aspect, the small d Democrat receiver oriented communicator rather than a source oriented communicator. Uh, these are all things that can be taught. And then there's special subjects under this revitalizing democracy. One that I raise is what, what, how are you gonna handle relations between the science community and the political community? This is becoming a big thing in this COVID crisis. Every government claims that their policy is science-based. And I've just written an op-ed actually suggesting that the scientists themselves should become the primary communicator in the public space of their science. Do not surrender that to political actors, to bureaucratic actors, even if they have a science degree or to media commentators exclusively, because they even unintentionally will have a biased interpretation. They will use the science that supports for their preconceived notions and they'll ignore the stuff that don't science, but you gotta work on that. How do we improve the relations between science and the political community. And then the last thing I get into is, uh, what can you say to faith-oriented people as to how to participate in the political arena? And uh, on that, I go back to the New Testament, but the, you know, the historians say that J Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the first, he only had three and, three and a half years of public work. The first year, he, he had this motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors and shepherds or whatever they were. They, they didn't do anything except follow him around and see, see what he did and see what he said. But about a year in, he decided he's going to send them out to do some public work in his name. But he, and there's this whole passage in Matthew where it gives an instruction. And the, the key instruction was be wise as serpents and gracious as doves, which are powerful analogies in the Jewish uh, lexicon. The wise as, as a serpent. The serpent was the symbol of the devil. It was be as wise as the forces of evil. And the dove was the symbol of the spirit of God, be as gracious as the spirit of God. And so I, I say, if you're a believer, and this doesn't just apply to Christians, if you're a faith-oriented person participating in democratic politics, be wise in how you do it and be gracious. And I always add, he did not say, be vicious as snakes and stupid as pigeons, which some of us <laughs> of a faith background are, are capable of doing. So these are all recruitment, uh, training, uh, special training for on the science side, the religious side. These are all things that could be done to, I think, to strengthen democracy. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the last uh, um, detour that 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 the conversation took. That, and you've done a fair bit of work on navigating the faith political interface. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, I think people of faith has have major things they can contribute. Uh, one is in this area of lawmaking. Uh, if if one wants to read a treatise on the attempt to achieve uh, conflict resolution and peace and prosperity through the rule of law, you cannot read a more thorough book than the, the than the Hebrew Scriptures, the, the Christian Old Testament, because wh what was that all about? It, there, there was a proclamation of the law of God through Moses, the, the Ten Commandments. You, you, get, you have a good illustration. 
description of that in non-religious language in that uh, book, that last book of yours. Uh, and then you have a 400-year experiment at trying to make people righteous by applying the rule of law with drastic penalties uh, proclaimed for breaking it and enormous blessings promised for keeping. But, but what, what was the conclusion of the Latter-day Prophets? That you couldn't make people righteous by law alone unless it could be internalized, unless it was written, as Isaiah said this, or Zechariah or somebody, unless the law can be written on the tablets of the heart, it's no good just having it on tablets of stone or parchment or in statute books or the revised statutes of Canada. Like that, that's an enormous lesson. The benefits of law and the rule of law, it's extreme importance, but it has limits. And that's something that people of faith, particularly Christians or, or Jewish people that understand that, that's an enormous contribution you can make. And particularly in these parliaments and legislatures today, where you've got people that think you can solve every problem by some action of government or some law of government, that, that would be a, a contribution that they could make. And well, then, the law has to reflect the spirit of the people that it serves. Otherwise, it would be yeah. just an imposition from outside, right? So it has to be part of this conversation that, that we've been talking about continually. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, then if you go to the New, New Testament, okay, okay, so you can't reconcile people to God or to each other by the rule of law alone. So what do you got the New Testament? You've got a different approach, self-sacrificial mediation. A mediator, for one thing, who incorporates both sides of the problem. And the vertical dimension, he's God and he's man. Uh, he, he, this is the very opposite of a judicial mediator who is distant, who, who has to keep himself distant from the parties. No, this mediator integrates both of them. He's on both sides. So, so how do you understand that, uh, both religiously and politically? Well, well, I can give you a, a sort of a hubris example of more from my consulting practice. One of, one of the things that um, I, I got involved in trying to reconcile some conflicts between oil companies and Aboriginal groups, <laughs> Gulf Oil had a, a heavy oil, this is a long time ago, so my, my details may be not be as correct as they should be, but they had a heavy oil pilot plant at Wabascaw, north of Lesser Slave Lakes, south and east of Fairview, where you yeah, it came from. And there was a big Aboriginal band there, the Big Stone Band, and there was going to be tensions between the oil company and the Aboriginals. And so the, the guy in charge of the project, his name was Norm. He was a prince of a guy who I really admired, except he used to swear all the time, and his favorite epitaph was Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think he knew that bothered me. But anyway, one day Norm says, we got to fire, we got to hire somebody to help deal with this potential coming conflict between us and the Big Stone Band. Uh, and he said, I want suggestions from all of you. I was a consultant and there was others there. And so a few weeks later, he says, well, I, I've got the suggestions back. The, the legal people want a legal beagle because, because they, they say this is going to get into court and they want somebody that can handle the legal aspects of the treaty relationship and the contract with the band and everything else. They want a legal beagle. He says the PR people want a pretty face that can explain all this on television and smooth it all over. And he says, and Manning here, because I had recommended a Métis guy that I knew in the community who hunted and fished with the Big Stone boys, and, but who'd also done contract work and was well-respected by golf. I recommended a, a, an in-between guy who incorporated both sides of the question. And so Norm says, and Manning here wants me to hire Jesus Christ. <laughs> And then he says, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take all the candidates down to the Athabasca River, the first one that could walk across the top. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, that, but he, Norm knew what I was getting at. You, you, yes, you can get a defender on one side or the other from a PR standpoint or legal standpoint. Or you can try to find a mediator who actually internalizes this conflict. And I think that person can play that reconciliation role better than the person from one side or the other. That's maybe not the best illustration. What, and what do you mean by internalizing the conflict? Well, in, in effect, the, the example of Jesus of Nazareth, like he, he, he took upon himself the sins of the people and sacrificed himself in order to satisfy the demands of the other party. And, and I think in this third party 
uh, reconciliation, maybe maybe the, by a mediator, and, and the difficulty in it is that the mediator pays the price of the reconciliation, pays a big portion of the price of the reconciliation. He'll be misunderstood by both sides, and, and they'll both come after him. And maybe that's why it's not such an attractive uh, profession. But I, I think that's what practicing what Jesus of Nazareth was talking about, the self-sacrificial media. Can you sacrifice your own interests in order to bring these two parties together? And that's in the name of, uh, of a higher virtue, in the name of peace or something like that. Yeah, 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 of en ending the conflict. Yeah, I, and uh, in that book, I, I also get into issue campaigns. I'm a great believer in issue campaigns. When we talk about training people uh, for political involvement, one is through formal training and courses and everything else. The, the other is in participating in an issue campaign. Like uh, reform, the year before reform elected its 52 members to the Canadian Parliament, that 1993, there, there was this referendum campaign on the Charlottetown Constitutional Accord where this constitutional accord was put together and Canadians were to vote on yes or no, do you want this? And so there's a referendum campaign. So now we got all involved in that and, and because it involves all the same things as an election campaign virtually. You got to give speeches, you got to prepare material, you got to knock on doors, you got to distribute material, you got to handle criticism and opposition. It's almost the same as an election campaign. And that, that for us was a training ground for the 1993 election. We trained constituency workers, we trained candidates, we trained spokespersons by participating in that issue campaign. And uh, coming back to the faith political, if, if you want, one wants to study issue campaigns, the classic issue campaign in the British parliamentary tradition is Wilberforce's anti-slavery campaign. It is an absolute classic. Every mistake that could be made was made. Every innovation in, in trying to win a campaign was made in that case. Uh, and it was very much motivated by people with a Christian perspective. So it's very instructive to faith oriented people. Even the way Wilberforce introduced the uh, the first motion in the House of British House of Commons that it considered this issue. The, the, the moralists at that time, like the moralists today, they, they wanted him to ride into the House of Commons on a white charger and, and just denounce slavery as an abomination from hell and anybody connected with it ought to have their head chopped off. That's what the moralists want to do. Let, let's place this historically. So this is taking place in Great Britain at what point? The, 17, the late 1700s. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. this is a very germane discussion because there's so much discussion right now about the idea of slavery being built into the United States, for example. And yeah, so this is, this, is a, this is a great historical story. Oh, yeah, and it's an alternative. The, the Americans, you know, the, our U.S. friends know, they, the Americans tried for 30 years by every other conceivable way to somehow come to grips with the slavery issue, but it didn't work and ended up in war, where in Britain they managed to do this. And while Wilberforce was t told and tempted to ride into the White House, uh, the horse, the Parliament on a white horse, his so friend, he was supposed to be like wielding the sword of moral yeah, righteousness yeah. as a as a what as a, a, a member of a Parliament, shining exemplar or something yeah, like that. But his friend Pitt, w William Pitt the Younger, was the uh, Prime Minister then. The guy became Prime Minister at age 24, 26. Right, right. Uh, and Pitt was his friend. Uh, and Pitt, Pitt, I think, told I can, don't know if I can prove this from the records, but I think Pitt told him, you do that, and that this issue can will not be discussed in this house for another 20 years. You, you take that up, you'll offend. So, so, why, so why, did, why did he, why was he able to say that? Why did he know that that wouldn't work, do you think? Well, because, well, because of, of was offending so much, everyone around was, the yes, uh, Well, there were so many British economic interests tied to slavery that if you come in crusading like that, you're not going to get any, anywhere, particularly in the House of Lords, which was even more prominent then than the House of Commons. So Wilberforce... So the day, was the danger there the, the exhibition of moral superiority, do you think? And no, the, I, think, I think it was a threat to economic interests that would just uh, shut it down. But Wilberforce responded by this resolution, and you can read it. I've got it in my book somewhere. Uh, that, that this house uh, give consideration to the circumstances surrounding the slave trade. He didn't even go to didn't even go to slavery itself. He went to the slave trade, something less. And that, that just that the house give consideration to the circumstances. And you can see his moral uh, compatriots say, "What a mealy mouthed." resolution is that, but he got it passed. 
He got it past. The house said, I don't like this stuff, but I guess it can't do any harm. <laughs> and he, that incremental way, and then, of course, that there was a 50-year campaign. But in the end of the day, 850,000 enslaved people throughout the British, uh, British Empire were declared free. And it's a classic case in, uh, uh, in the issue campaign with a moral, with a very moral dimension to it. Uh, right. Well, and you, 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 you prefaced that story with the idea of the mediator who takes the battle on, inside himself in some sense. And yeah, so yeah. How, how do you see that playing out in the case of Wilberforce? You, you're, the claim, and this is obviously not a claim that's limited to you, that it was Wilberforce's Christianity that, that influenced his opposition to slavery. And how do you understand that opposition as well and its relationship with Christianity? Well, I, I say I th the, the opposition to this, I think, was came mainly from economic interests and then, and then from political people who say, if, I, if I'm on that side, I'm going to lose my seat the next time uh, around. So you had that, that motivation. But uh, Wilberforce took an enormous amount of abuse for all this. Uh, like he tried to take this sort of moderate view, and so he was lambasted by the zealots on his own side. And then he, because what he's proposing is something that's offensive to the more ruling class economically and politically, he, he's, uh, he, he offends them. And uh, he, he's denounced on both sides, but he, he takes that on. And so that, that's what's going to happen if you're this, this mediator uh, in between. They, they lost motion after motion. They, they lost one motion by, uh, by six or eight votes because the... Uh, some of the members went off to have a drinking party or something and, and just a, a discouragement, but they managed to triumph in the end. And I, I think there's a model in that campaign as to how to conduct issue campaigns, particularly on moral and ethical issues, and uh, particularly from a, a faith perspective is that's one's perspective. And so, the, okay, so let's, let's focus again on this, on the motivation that Wilberforce had as a consequence of his belief. Like, what was it that inspired him to work for that length of time and under those conditions against slavery? What, what was the central belief, do you think, that he was trying to put forward? Well, he was I regarded think it, as morally wrong, but it was an established part of society at that point. So, and, and of course, slavery has existed in many forms for virtually forever. So what was, the, what was the inspiring idea that enabled him to do that and enabled it to work? Well, well, he seemed to be very much motivated by suffering, any evidence of suffering, not just slavery. Like he, he founded another society for dealing with poverty, another society for dealing with cruelty to animals. The guy seemed to be very touched and, and motivated by any instance of slavery, of, of suffering. And of course, slavery was a great uh, example of it. And then I think from his Christian perspective, he was convinced there was such a, evil was a reality, that there is such a thing as evil, and it has to be combated, and it can become institutionalized. And uh, I think his conception of evil on the negative side and his uh, desire to alleviate suffering on the positive side, the two of those seem to combine to, to, to motivate him. Well, it, it's, it seems to me as well that in, in, in Christianity, I don't think it's limited necessarily to Christianity, but you see it very well developed in Christianity, is the idea that every human being has something about them that's of eternal and, and transcendent value, and that political systems, economic systems, any other system has to take that into account when, when it's operating. Otherwise, that's the transgressing against something that's of, of, of fundamental and primary yeah. importance. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very, yeah. it's a remarkable idea. Yeah, but you pay a price for tr trying to go down that uh, down that route, you know, and maybe that's why it's not many take it. So you you met with a, a very small number of people to begin with when you were when you had decided to do do whatever it was necessary to produce a political party. Had you planned, in fact, on producing a party? Did that emerge across time? No, no, and the, the, at this first meeting, there were five people at it. Uh, one was Dr. David Elton, who was the head of the uh, Canada West Foundation, which did work on Western issues. But D David was also a pollster. And, and David said, look, I, as a pollster, I, ca I, can, I, I can't tell you that there is a market for a new party. In fact, what I can tell you is there's no apparent, uh, there's no apparent mar uh, market for a new party. He was sympathetic to what we were doing, but he, that was his contribution uh, 
uh, Jim Gray was uh, at that meeting, a, a very prominent uh, uh, oil person who was opposed to creating a new party because he knew the free trade issue was coming up, being promoted by the Maloney government. He was afraid that any new initiative in the West would split the free trade vote, and he was very much in favor of free trade, as was I. So he had that worry. Uh, uh, Ted Byfield, who was the head of the Alberta Report, Ted was sick that day and was there in spirit, but Ted was all for <laughs> doing whatever you had to do to get attention and get these issues addressed. Um, and there were two oil patch lawyers there, too, who uh, um, basically said, well, whatever you think we should do, we should do. But, so anyway, we, the group couldn't agree on a course of action other than why don't we have a, a, a small conference somewhere out of Alberta, actually, in Vancouver, so it's not just an Alberta thing, and put the options to the people we can get there. Do, do we work within a new party? Do we create a new advocacy pressure group of some kind? If, if we work within a party, what party? Uh, and what about this third party option, which is part of the Western tradition? And, and so, what were the issues that were driving them and you at the time, the, pri the primary issues? Well, well the, the angst in the oil patch about the National Energy Program that's confiscating $100 billion worth of wealth from the Western provinces. Uh, uh, the uh, CF-18 issue, people won't remember what that was, but there was a maintenance contract that was won by Bristol Aircraft in Winnipeg, and then it was taken away from them, despite the fact that they were the lowest bidder and best prepared to do it and given to a Montreal firm. There was all these irritants. And then there was a, 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 a approaching a $50 billion deficit to which this, this, this is under a conservative government. This is something that fiscal conservatives were concerned about. And then the West perennial complaints about the Senate, our Senate, unelected, unaccountable, yeah, ineffective, uh, uh, no adequate representation from Western Canada. This was all boiling around there. And the creation of separatist parties were being created in Western Canada, separatists elected a member to the Alberta legislature. So all of this is boiling around, just creating unrest. So the only conclusion we could come from this meeting is let's have another meeting, <laughs> very Canadian. And, and so we had this conference in uh, Vancouver and people made the arguments for the different. I, I actually wrote to Moroni, the prime minister at the time, and said, look, this Western alienation is going to, it's going to get out of hand. It's going to cost you politically. Why don't you send your best guy to argue that the federal conservative party is still the best vehicle for addressing these discontents? And I even suggested your best guy to do that would be Don Mazankowski, who was his finance minister, who's from Alberta, very respected a man, very, very respected by myself and most of the rest of us. And, and Moroni wrote back and said, I will not send Mazankowski or anybody. You guys have already decided you're going to create a new party, which, which wasn't true. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. And he said, not only will I not send Mazankowski, I will forbid any of my members, including my Western members, from attending any such meeting which was precisely the wrong thing to do. Anyway, so we had this conference in Vancouver, uh, and uh, somebody argued for working within the existing party. Somebody argued for uh, creating a pressure group or a advocacy group, uh, and there was a couple of other options. And I made the speech in favor of the West has created new parties to do this, what we want to do, and they could do it again. And they took a vote, and, and the new party option won. And they passed a resolution to have a founding convention in Winnipeg a short time after. And that's how it got off the ground. So what made you convinced that there was enough discontent, say, in the West, that this was the right time to act? Well, because I've been waiting around for 20 years watching all this. And it, I used a consulting firm to, to chase political issues and keep track of things, do polling and everything else. And uh, well, when I was in university, I, when I was in university, I started out in physics, and, and, and then uh, I couldn't handle the math, so I went into economics, where you can make the math work by changing the assumptions. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Joe, the, the, the real political actors th th then are, uh, talk about upstream. Joe Clark was the leader of the Progressive Conservative Club on campus. Jim Coots, who became the principal secretary to Pierre Trudeau, was the liberal leader. Grant Notley. Uh, 
uh, who became the leader of the NDP in Alberta, was the leader of the NDP on campus. And Joel used to try to convince me. Joel was committed to the conservatives. And he wouldn't say the conservatives were perfect or anything, but he, he was concerned. I'm going to try to make them better and all the rest. And he tried to persuade me to, you ought to throw in your lot with us. And I said, no, I, I, I think I'll wait. I think the West, this is way back. I think the West is going to produce something new one of these days. And I think I'll wait around for that. Now, this, it took 20 years for that to happen. But I kind of had that feeling, and partly from my study of the, uh, of the Western political tradition and our own family's tradition. My, my father was part of the, the last wave, the Depression Party, creation of political parties. So I, I just had this feeling that it was going to the West was going to produce a new party, and then by the late 1980s, it was the time it was right. Now, the, the I, I thought that derives from this, it, it, it's hard to reform was conceptualized as being right wing, but th there were polls taken with on um, Canadians of are you right wing or left wing, and they're taken today. O only maybe 13 to 15 percent ever say that they're right wing. And only 12 or percent say they're left wing in any, any kind of extreme sense. They all say they're moderate. You know, why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? So, uh, and ref reform, I mean, while it was conservative, it was advocating change, which is often seen as incompatible with conservatism. We, we wanted to balance the budget, which was different than what had been done. We, we wanted to reform the, the Senate. We, we wanted freer votes in the parliament. These were all political innovations that were hardly conservative in a sort of a traditional uh, sense. But uh, s since then, I, I keep thinking on how can you strengthen the conservative positions, conservative contributions to a better Canada and a better de democracy. And, and there's a, a more uh, up-to-date list on that. Uh, one of the things I think conservatives have to do is distinguish between the conservative party and the conservative movement. I, have, I use in the book, I use this triangle saying the party's at the top. It's the one that gets elected to the legislation, the parliament. But underneath it are the think tanks and generators of intellectual capital. The political parties generate very little intellectual capital themselves. They got no time. They got no inclination. Somebody else has to do it. Well, the conservative think tanks can do that, but they got to be more vigorous and better funded, etc. There's an advocacy group. The party can only crusade on certain things, but there's advocacy groups that can crusade on, uh, you know, if you want to get a mixed public and private health care system, somebody else got a crusade on that. The parties will pick it up if it gets enough public support. So there's all, all this infrastructure underneath, the think tanks, advocacy groups, communicators, uh, fundraisers, recruiters, trainers, and all that. Uh, and I, I argue that the stronger that movement is, the stronger, the better the party will uh, perform. And so a lot of my subsequent work has been on trying to strengthen the movement. The uh, Another concept that we introduce is this political realignment that from time to time conservatives have to fundamentally shift in some way. And that this is not, incom this is not incompatible with being conservative. Like Edmund Burke used to, to talk about this. I mean, he's considered um, our arch conservative uh, theorist in, in many respects, but he, he said conservatives and change have to coexist because the conditions change. Mm -hmm. And so in order to conserve the principle, you have to change. And I used to illustrate this. Uh, I, I did this community development work in North Central Alberta. And on an, uh, on an old road east of Slave Lake, there used to be a sign, a, a great big heavy post with a crossboard on it with one word on it, Saw Ridge, and an arrow pointing west. It was pointing towards the town of Saw Ridge. And that sign never changed its message, it never changed its direction, never changed its position, no matter how the wind blew or how much snow. But if you followed the directions on that sign, you would never get to the town of Sawridge. Well, why was that? Because the town changed its name. It changed its location after a flood in the 1930s. The roads to get there were changed to half a dozen times. So the very conservatism of that sign, it's unmoving in its commitment. We're always saying the same thing. We're always pointing with an error rather than, uh, than pointing to the truth. And so this need for fundamentally realigning conservatives with the times has become a, and the way we advocated reform was a form of that, trying to get that realignment, change the old progressive. So what do you, what do you see as the central tenets of uh, 
an updated conservatism and what sort of attraction do you think they might have or could have for, for people who are curious about the political endeavor, philosophical endeavor, et cetera, distinguish that from the liberals or the progressives? Well, I think that's a very important point. I, I think there's been some just trying to be a pale imitation of the liberals or NDP does not get you uh, anywhere. I, I think the challenge is to present distinctive alternatives. And the areas and I think that the I, conservatives in the U.S. are struggling with that at the moment too, especially the moderate conservatives. The, yes. you know the people who occupy that huge majority that you described that are not committed well, well, to the left or the right. There's a number of things going to be done. What one is, I know this is getting repetitive. One is to, to harness some of these populist forces rather than oppose them or distance them from them. And if you want an example of that, uh, Boris Johnson in Britain, the Conservative Party has has internalized that Brexit philosophy, which is a bottom-up populist thing. Instead of opposing it, they, they've become the champion of it. So fig figure out what some of these roots of the current populism, particularly in the West, this Western alienation, be, and address it rather than distance yourself from it or say, we don't want to deal with that. That's one thing that can be done. Uh, a, a second thing is, uh, I think, to refresh conservative language even on this balancing budgets and, and fiscal things, it sort of said the same things over and over and over again in the old language. There's a need to refresh the language. There's other ways of saying balancing the budget than saying we're going to slash spending. We're going to make the more productive use of the dollar of the taxpayer, but find some way to refresh your, your language. Uh, adopt a green conservatism. I think conservatives have to get, I've been slow to get onto the environmental uh, issues, but offer a distinction from what the Liberals and the Greens and the Socialists are. Mainly use market mechanisms to address uh, environmental conservation as distinct from just nothing but government regulation on top of government regulation. I think there's things that can be done uh, there. there. There's uh, uh, additional, as I, I mentioned, with respect to getting young people, if, if you don't talk to young people in terms of the old left, right, center spectrum, but uh, adopt some of the conceptual frameworks. You, your language, adopt conceptual frameworks that are more in the heads of those younger uh, people. Uh, offering a different approach to poverty. Like the, 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 uh, the other side has one standard approach to dealing with poverty, income redistribution through progressive taxation. That's basically the approach to poverty by the liberals and the socialists and even the Greens. And conservatives can offer an alternative, which is basically a better distribution of the tools of wealth creation, which conservatives know a lot about. Um, access to capital, micro capital, access to technology, access to markets that ordinary people don't have before. And I, I spent 20 years trying to do this in that north central Alberta area. And I know that approach can work. We, we that that area of Alberta was uh, my my father did some studies this last years in uh, asking why were certain areas of Alberta not prospering the way that most of the rest of the province was and one of the areas was that big central north central area between Fort McMurray and the oil sands and the Peace River country on the on the west and what, one day we had this little consulting firm. Uh, uh, a small group of guys from Slave Lake, the town of Slave Lake, came in and said, we want to establish a community development company with two object uh, objectives. One is it's got to earn a return on the capital that's invested, so it's a capitalist institution. But we want to undertake projects that have got social benefit to this community. In particular, we need rental housing for the some of the workers that are coming in. There's absolutely nothing here. We want a dual it would, would be called a social enterprise today was what they were talking about. And they, they asked us to, I'd given speeches on this, so they came to us and, they, and we agreed to, to help. And so we created this company called Slave Lake Developments Limited. We sold shares, common shares at a dollar a share. It took, took a, a 18 months to raise $100,000. These people have never owned a share in anything. The, the Securities Commission said, why on earth would you be using this mechanism to raise $100,000? This is an education exercise as much as it is a capital raising exercise. And so we, we managed to get uh, 
some money. And then we established contacts between these people with some of the oil companies that were moving into the area that they didn't have. No, not contacts with the field people, contacts with the head offices in, in Calgary. We had the connections there. So we gave them contacts. All of this is distributing tools of wealth uh, creation. We, we talked, I know I'm rambling on, but one day in our little consulting firm, we got a phone call. I got a phone call from Bill Twaits, the president of Imperial Oil. Rarely, well, you knew my dad. I think that's why I called the office. Anyway, he says, I hear you. My Calgary people say you're trying to get a social investment out of Imperial Oil. He says, we don't have a social investment policy. What are you trying to do? Well, I explained to him. Well, he says, this is a real estate project. Go to our real estate guy. I said, no, because I know what return your real estate guy wants, and this project will give it. Well, he says, if it's a charity thing, go to our charity guy. I said, no, we've been telling these people there's another way to raise money than going around with your hand out to the government or to a, a donor. No, we, we want an investment from you. You're going to make it a 6% return on it, but there's going to be a social benefit, which will actually benefit you too, because some of your workers will have a place. So Twait says, well, we don't have a policy on that. I'll have to take it to the board, he says. <laughs> and I, 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 he's pulling my leg. I can just imagine the board of Imperial Oil. <laughs> considering a $25,000 investment in slavery. So anyway, the guy calls back another two weeks. He says, my people, I, I know he'd ever took it to court. He says, my people say to give you the money. He says, and I know you're going to run around Calgary saying you got a social investment out of Imperial Oil, but I want you to know what his voice is. Right. As far as I'm concerned, it's charity. And he slammed the thing down. A anyway, we got this project going. It got going. The, the, the project got built. The, the, the community company earned enough to be able to pay off the oil company. We put on a little dinner in Calgary for the oil companies. It was Imperial Mobile Rainbow Pipeline. Uh, yeah, and uh, we put to thank him, and, and we took pictures. Here, here's your original twenty-five thousand dollars getting back. Here, here's your six percent dividend. We took pictures, and Walt Dingle was the imperial guy. And we took, sent these to Twain. Said, "Here's your getting your money back. Here's your dividend." And, and I, I added, "And it ain't charity." And then the ironic thing at the end of this dinner, Ed Braden, who was the mobile representative, came to me and says. Uh, this is all very nice, he says, but it creates a bit of a problem for us. We all treated it as a charity and wrote it off. So the accountants won't know what to do with these checks. So is there some charitable project up there that you can give it back to? And so the money went around twice. But to make a long story short, this what we did for, was just give them the tools of wealth creation. I talked to the provincial government. Instead of building a little provincial building in every town in the province, in this case, why don't you give them a 20-year lease for 40,000 square feet that they can take to a, a financial company and get a mortgage, the first big commercial mortgage in the town? Like, why don't you do that? And we got that. And anyway, I, had, I was president of the company for a number of years to get it off the ground. Then I had to leave when we got into the political business. And they ended up getting professional management. And they, they branched out from Slave Lake. They didn't want all their eggs in one basket. They got a whole bunch of projects. 40, 45 years later, whatever, they still had these basic shareholders. Nobody could own more than 10% of the company. They had these 300 local shareholders. They sold the company for $55 million and distributed that among those shareholders. Now, that's a fair amount of money. And that is a addressing a, a, a poverty-stricken area. But by the, that time, it wasn't poverty-stricken. But the, it was accomplished by the, the distribution, better distribution of the tools of wealth creation as distinct from just handing them money from a pot that's been raised through progressive taxation. And what, why can't conservatives champion that approach to poverty alleviation as a, as a distinctive of the the conservative movement. And so I've got a whole list of things like that that I think conservatives could do that would advance the cause and address the problems facing the country. So I want to ask you a little bit more about the development of the party. You talked about the founding convention. Let's go from there. And then I want to ask you about your view of Canada currently. Well, yeah, then to build the party, like we, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and so we had to uh, we had to do it through a lot of public uh, me meetings. Uh, eventually, after I got to Ottawa, because we're still building the par party after that, we trying to we, the idea was to create a national party, not just a Western party. Uh, and, and the constitution of the party also had a sunset clause in it that it would come to an end in ten years. And I wanted that because I knew this political realignment 
principle that after 10 years, however we'd set it up in the beginning, was going to have to change fundamentally. And, and so there was that sunset clause, and that's what allowed us to create the Canadian Alliance as the next iteration of the thing, because the party had to decide whether to continue in its current form, do something else. But the promo well, by the time we got to Ottawa, we're still trying to promote it as a national party. <clears throat> My schedule was 50 days a year at home in Calgary, 100 days a year in Ottawa, and 200 days on the road for year after year after year. Uh, and we had some very good... Uh, uh, staff people and, and people on our, our board that made huge sacrifices in, in order to do that. But it, you, I mean, it's a big country. <laughs> Crusade from East Point of Newfoundland to Tofino in BC, from Coots, Alberta to uh, Yukon. It, uh, but it was basically done by grassroots organization, public meetings. And when after you created the party, you entered the first election. What were the what were the consequences in the first election? Well, the first election we ran in nineteen. The party was only formed in nineteen eighty seven. So we and then the next election came in nineteen eighty eight. That was a free trade election, and we ran seventy two candidates. None of them won. We we finished second in eleven or twelve seats, and there was a real question: Is like, is this worth carrying on? We we, we got some support, but not enough to elect anybody. And then uh, uh, a conservative member that had been erect, elected in the riding of Beaver River in Alberta uh, passed away. He, the guy had cancer and didn't survive more than a couple of months after the election. So there was a by-election. And we had a candidate there, and talk about a grassroots bottom-up party, named Deborah Gray. And she was a school teacher on the Frog Lake Reserve, which is one of the the very depressed reserves in Alberta, the fact how she could contribute what she contributed there is a miracle in itself. And, and she was our candidate in the general election. She finished second. And then the question would be, should I as the leader run in that by-election? Because we would have a good chance of getting it. People can take a chance in a by-election because it's not going to upset anything. Uh, or should she? But she, she, she was very popular, very articulate. And she, talk, she was a Small D Democrat. Deborah's a small D Democrat. Yes, she's conservative in that, but her dominant philosophy is a small D Democrat, people's understanding, people's representative. And so Deborah uh, contested the by election and we won. So now we got one seat in the Parliament of Canada represented by Deborah Gray. And Stephen Harper, who was our, uh, our policy chief, who we got, Stephen was. Uh, um, uh, we, get, we had no money, so I said, where are we going to get a policy chief? We can't pay him anything. But it occurred to me, graduate students at university, <laughs> they're, they're exploitable. So I, I called the Dr. Bob Mansell, who was an economist at the University of Calgary, whom I'd done work with. I said, Bob, who's your smartest economics student, graduate student, that might be willing to go on a political adventure? And he gave me one name, Stephen Harper. So Stephen became our policy chief. And then when Deborah won, Stephen went with her uh, as her uh, executive assistant, but as our, our main staff person in Ottawa. And the thing got off the ground. And she took an enormous amount of abuse. And uh, it, it makes me uh, uh, mad in, in retrospect, uh, particularly to hear, hear the liberals talk about how they would champion women being involved in politics. They did everything in their power to defeat Agnes Campbell McPhail, the first woman member of our, and they were as abusive to Deborah as you could possibly be. If a conservative said things that they said to her about a liberal female cabinet minister, they'd be censored all over. The cancel culture would come to the fore, but there was, and so Deborah put up with a lot of abuse. We were on this fiscal responsibility thing. She she took a ten percent cut in pay, which was unheard of in, in Ottawa. In fact, the finance department said they didn't know how, there was no way to do it. <laughs> so, so that's how we got a foothold. And then we kept building, 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 building. And, uh, and uh, then by the 93 election, we, we had a substantive organization enough to win the 52 seat. Right, and what happened to Mulroney's conservatives in that election? Well, they were completely, they, they were reduced to, uh, absolutely reduced to, to not, nothing. They, they were reduced to two seats. It was the greatest defeat in, uh, uh, between two new parties, the, the bloc in Quebec and reform alone. We, we took 106 
seats out of the uh, uh, of the 300 and some seats that were in the parliament at that time. Of course, the Liberals under Jean Chrétien formed the formed the government, but uh, the Liberals only elected two members: uh, Jean Charest and Elsie uh, Wayne from uh, New Brunswick. And we used to kid that they didn't like this. We said, "You're the most valuable members of Parliament because the Conservatives spent 22 million dollars on the campaign. <laughs> You're each worth 11 million dollars." <laughs> they didn't like that. But that's how it got off the ground. And then we, we we're constantly trying to do this coalition building. Like, um, so th then uh, I, I could tell we, we weren't going to go much further with reform. So we created this conservative reform alliance. Uh, and basically- and that was with the leftovers, so to speak, of the conservative party. No, no, this was basically with provincial allies, with the Klein conservatives oh. in Alberta, oh, okay. the Philman conservatives in Manitoba and the Harris conservatives, particularly Mike Harris was very helpful. Does and the Harris Conservatives in Ontario, and that created the uh, the, the Canadian Alliance. And then, say, so I lost the leader. I kept pushing the envelope on all this stuff, and you know, I, I was losing. There's always people who were opposed to these changes. And by the time it got to the leadership of the alliance, and we'd been, you know, campaigning in the election, campaigning for change, just constant campaigning. I, and then the joke was that the operation was a success, but the doctor died. <laughs> Uh, and it was Stockwell Day became the leader of the uh, alliance. It, it didn't go too well for Stock. And then Harper uh, came back and became the leader of the alliance. And he and Peter McKay, whom we talked to before, but Peter would never come in. But uh, they got together and managed to put together the new Conservative Party of, of Canada. So it's a, from those very humble beginnings, one seat ended up with a majority government, majority Conservative government in 2010. Right, and that was under that was under Harper. Under Harper, yeah, yeah. And so, what were the consequences of that for for Canada? Do you think what what did that accomplish? Well, well you had a change in direction on a number of things. Uh, Har St Stephen Harper is basically an economist; has always been. He he has a b better grasp of public finance and the economy than uh, I would argue than anybody in that current federal cabinet. He's had a fixation with it. His, his master's thesis was on whether there was a connection between the bank rate and the election cycle. Not, not many people would be interested in that subject, but his question was, did the bank liberalize credit in an election year in order to kind of make grease the wheels a little bit for whoever was proposing what, you know, which is an interesting thesis. But uh, so, so he, he, he made a major effort to balance the, keep the budget balanced, because we got the budget balanced under, under Gretchen. There was enough pressure on the Liberals to, they finally had to come around to do that. But uh, Stephen got uh, uh, sidetracked or uh, affected by the, the downturn in 2008, uh, 2009. I think I've got my years right. Mm -hmm. uh, so they got knocked off the budget balancing path for a while. Uh, he, he negotiated a whole bunch of fr freer trade arrangements, with not, not just with the United States, but a number of other countries. He endeavored to change the equalization to be a little more favorable to the West. He pushed Senate reform as far as you could push it until the Supreme Court says you cannot amend the constitutional references to the Senate without uh, the approval of seven of the provinces with 60% uh, of the population. So he did uh, a number of things. And uh, there's been complaints from conservatives about uh, the Harper administration. Why didn't you do more for the West? And uh, I went to lunch with Stephen one time and put that question to him. And if he responded in two ways. He gave me this list of here's what we did do. We don't get a lot of credit for it, but here's what we did do. It was this list of items that I've mentioned. But secondly, he said, there was not the pressure on us to do more for the West that one would have expected given our Western roots. His Western guys seemed to assume that because we were there, we would do it. And he, he argued there was more pressure from, I think he had six or eight members from Quebec, there was more pressure from them to do something for Quebec than there was from that big block of Western members who just kind of assumed it should be done. So one of the lessons... Yeah, well, that, it's necessary if you want something done often to put forward a fairly detailed plan and to keep up the agitation. You can't yeah. just assume that things are going to go your way because yeah. it isn't obvious that people will even know what that means in detail. Yeah. Yes, and particularly if you don't have the n numbers because uh, ultimately a large block of m members from Ontario particularly, it's not that the parliament was dominated by Western representatives at that time. So uh, th those were some of the accomplishments, and but not now the future is uh, 
uh, can, can conservatism revitalize itself and offer a principled alternative to the current government? And there'll be an election uh, fairly soon, fairly soon. Well, so let's talk about the current state of affairs. So um, what have you, do you know Justin Trudeau? No, not re- not personally. And, and that's the thing you have to be careful about making judgments just from what you, in the media. Again, I keep going back to my father's, Teaching. I, I came home one time vehemently denouncing a couple of politicians in Alberta. And uh, he says, uh, how, how do you know they're that bad? <laughs> well, I said, you know, I've seen what they've been saying. I've read the stuff in the media. They're a bunch of scoundrels. Well, he said, I'll, uh, let's do a little experiment here. I, I'll, I'll, let's get a list of five politicians that you have an opinion on and write, write down your opinion on them, ne- negative ones that you have negative opinions on. And I'll arrange one way or another for you to meet them or at least be at a small meeting where they are where you can maybe get a first-hand assessment as distinct from getting it from the media or whatever. And so we did that. And then they said, then I want you to come back and tell me if your impression is the same as it was before. And we did, and uh, I came back with uh, four out of the five. I actually had a more positive impression after actually meeting them and seeing them than I did by just absorbing what I absorbed through the media and that, which told me you got to be careful about making these uh, judgments um, without... Yeah, well, it's very difficult to know when you're informed by media sources just how partial your information is because you don't have anything to counter it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the best, and none of us can actually, you know, go and say, "I want a personal meeting with the prime minister." But there are ways of getting closer to people that are close to them, have watched them, have done things. Uh, you know, there are ways to get closer than just to rely on media or partisan material. But with respect to Justin Trudeau, I, I don't feel he, he's a prime minister uh, in the real sense. I, I, one of the things I worry about is virtual mm-hmm. politics, politics being conducted in virtual space as distinct from real political democratic space. And I get a feeling that Justin Trudeau is a, a former drama teacher playing the role of prime minister as distinct from being a prime minister. I, I think the we don't have a finance minister. I think we have a, a virtual prime minister, we, uh, a finance minister. We have a, fi- a well-meaning journalist, perhaps, but uh, playing the role of a finance minister, nothing in her background that would suggest that. Uh, a grasp of, of public finance or the economy or anything else. And I, I worry about us getting into a virtual uh, politics that is this, not the real thing, that, that the country doesn't have a real prime minister, doesn't have a real finance minister. And, and what, one of the analogies that has come home to me on this, uh, you, you know, Sandra and I watch some of these medical shows on TV, you know, the, the Good Doctor, The Resident, in Chicago Med, there's a bunch of them. And those actors are very, very good at playing the role of doctors and nurses. I mean, they, they're charismatic. They talk. They, they show them in the operating room doing something with somebody's liver and putting it in a tray like you would think these are real doctors. But they are. They're actors playing the role very, very well. But if you were ill and you've been through this, would you want one of them to actually operate on you? Or would you want the real thing? Even if the real thing, maybe she's not, that, that doctor's not charismatic or he's got a wart on his nose or there's something wrong, but but he knows how to do the real thing. And I, I, I think the country's uh, in danger of, uh, of being governed in this virtual space as distinct from the actual space. So that's, I, I don't think of Justin Trudeau as a real prime minister. The, the second thing is I, I worry that he is guided by ideologies that have little or nothing to do with Canada. This embracing of cr- critical race theory is not a Canadian-rooted theory or philosophy. Well, he has stated publicly, as far as I understand, that Canada doesn't really have a culture. Well, yeah, so that, that may be. be. And, and so, but he's importing these uh, theories from basically from the United States. The critical race theory, identity politics, uh, wokeism, and, and cancel culture, and uh, I, I, particularly Western Canada does not see that as e- even Canadian. Don't see it as Canadian. Our, our prime minister is guided by some 
uh, philosophy basically the, the fact that the reaction to black lives matter which is understandably the kind of issue it is in the united states but to just import that here when if you want to get off on racial discrimination surely the emphasis here should have been on the indian act and the uh, indigenous and aboriginal population so the, the fact that uh, we have a virtual prime minister, not a real prime minister, and one guided by ideologies that, in my view, are not Canadian, is is uh, reason enough for his uh, for his replacement. And I, I think the worry. I think there's backroom people in the Liberal Party that will concede, ne never on the, <laughs> in the public uh, arena, that that Justin Trudeau is not the sharpest knife in the political kitchen, and that Mark Carney has a far better grasp of all this stuff. He's not reading off a script when he d d does it. And that, uh, but if you're headed for liberal leadership under Mark Carney, then all, all these things, uh, particularly this ideological orientation, is, is liable to get uh, deeper and worse rather than, than better. A lot of Western Canadians can't understand why Trudeau just falls all over himself to be recognized in Washington and Beijing and you know, the Davos crowd and makes no effort to bolster his fortunes in Winnipeg or Regina or Edmonton or Calgary. We know they're not as dramatic places as Washington and Beijing, but this is your own country and you're the prime minister of that part of the country. So what do you think it is on the conservative side that's not putting up a sufficient, let's say, offense or defense against this? Or, or do you think the tide will turn in the next election? It, it doesn't look well, like a well, I, I think that, to that, me. that come back to what we've talked about before. I, I think conservatism needs to be rejuvenated by some of these things we've talked about, it, by uh, a realignment, by uh, adopting a realistic position on the environment, by offering an alternative on the poverty question, on uh, de dealing with balance. I, I think the conservatives could champion balance as a very major part of their uh, uh, position. The, the, What's the balance between health protection and, and civil rights protection? What's the balance between economy and uh, and uh, the in environment? Uh, uh, balance used to be a fundamental political characteristic of Canadian. That, that joke about why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? And, and not just a middle that's a meaningless compromise, but a, a substantive middle that you could stand on. I, I think if the Conservatives could do that sort of thing, they could offer a principled alternative to the the liberals, but uh, at present, that's not developing. Hopefully, it might, from my standpoint, under Aaron O'Toole, but it's not developing yet. And what the Conservatives' federal party has to watch is it has to address this Western alienation. It, it's got a huge base in Western Canada, but it's got to. Uh, do, do you see any signs of that happening? And it looks to me like the Conservatives, over recent years, have struggled, certainly on the charisma end of, of the leadership spectrum. And that seems to be, at least in part, why. Trudeau was able to make the inroads that he made. I mean, maybe people believed it was time for a change as well, because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nine years is often the lifespan. Well, I, th I think the jury's still out on Aaron O'Toole. There's still opportunity, but uh, t time is getting short. And uh, as I, I say, I think there's a need for revitalizing conservatism at the federal level. And I try and list all... Uh, in that book, I try and list some of those things that can be done. The... Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether the, the country has to get into real, even deeper trouble than it is now. I mean, it's in trouble. It's in trouble on the economy. It's in trouble on the international stage. It's not respected. Whether things have to get worse before they can get better. My, my father dealt with four federal administration. Mackenzie King, uh, during the, the latter part of the Depression and the war, uh, Louis Saint Laurent. Uh, John D. from Baker and Lester Pearson. And he, he said the strongest federal cabinet he dealt with, and he didn't agree with everything they did by any stretch of the imagination, was Mackenzie King's war cabinet. When the country got into a war or the prospect of a war, the leaders could go to somebody, uh, King could go to Saint Laurent, who was a high powered constitutional lawyer in Quebec with no, no idea of getting into federal policy. So you, you have to count the country's in touch. C.D. Howe uh, was a business guy who uh, normally would not have stayed in politics the length of time that he did, but Howe, Howe could go to business people and say, you are coming to Ottawa to help organize wartime production. And when they asked, what are you going to pay me? He said, I'll pay you a dollar a year. And they came, and they came. 
And uh, I sometimes wonder if things have to get to that point where you can go to some of these people that could make a much greater contribution than what we've got there now and say, look, your country is, I don't care what you're doing academically or business-wise, you, you, you've got to come, you've got to run for public office and offer an alternative. But it's a shame that you you have to get to that. So what what do you think are the fundamental issues that face Canadians at the moment? What You, you, you well, said the country is, is in trouble in well, some I, ways. and. Well, I think one is this national unity problem. I, I don't think particularly Central Canada understands the depth of this Western alienation. Again. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you ever had a dual separatist movement, Quebec moving in that direction and the West moving at the same time, you, you'd tear the country apart. I, I don't think there's an appreciation by the Laurentian elites that that old model of Canada is not sufficient for the 21st century. So that and Canadians can never take national unity for granted. Our, our country is too big and too diverse to just hope it's going to hang together. So that that's one issue. The second is the fiscal issue. Th these astronomical deficits and debts, and no uh, even recognition that this could be a, a problem. When when we were crusading uh, the, uh, against the uh, unbalanced budget in the, the 1990s, the, the Liberals didn't object didn't to oppose the ultimate objective. So yeah, eventually you've got to balance the budget, but you guys are going too fast or you're, you're doing it the wrong way or you're cutting it, but they didn't uh, oppose the ultimate objective. But today, there's it's not even stated as an objective. They, they bought into this new monetary theory that you can overspend and print money and, and as long as it doesn't seem to register in terms of the immediate inflation, you can do it ad infinitum. And so I think restoring the fiscal health of the country is going to be an enormous challenge. And I don't know whoever does that is going to face an, a, a terrible task because it can't be done as quickly as it should be or could be without causing enormous pain. And then our, our relations with the rest of the world, I, I think they've been they've deteriorated uh, under to the, this almost pathetic desire to be recognized by the world elites, the Davos crowd, the you know, Washington crowd, and in Beijing, I, I think is a, a dangerous uh, thing. I, I think on the international stage, the big, big 21st century competition is between the state-directed democracy as promoted by the Communist Party and government of China and citizen-directed democracy as traditionally practiced in the West, but which is in a lot of trouble and state-directed capitalism as, and they call it that, they call it capitalism, state-directed capitalism versus market-driven capitalism, the Western version. Uh, I think the, the West needs strong ideological leadership on those two, on those two fronts. And we're certainly not getting that from, uh, from hardly any Western leader, let alone uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, this, uh, I know we don't want to get off on the China thing, but, uh, uh, I, I went to China several times. I went to China once as the fish leader of the opposition. I got to know some of these people in the International Liaison Department of the Co Communist Party, which is the party's foreign affairs department that establishes relationships with political parties all over the world. And, and, and these are the guys that meet you at the airport, and, and they have the standard questions. Is there somebody else? You know, it's all been planned out, but is there somebody else you'd like to see or some other place you want to go? And so I knew one of these fellows well enough to pull his leg. So I said, yes, I would like to meet my equivalent. I would like to meet the leader of the official opposition in China. <laughs> so, so he goes away and huddles with his officials and comes back and says, we think if there is such a guy, he's in jail <laughs> or he should be. But, but then he got serious. He said, the closest thing to you is that Martin Lee in Hong Kong, who is the leader of the Democratic uh, faction in, in Hong Kong. But on all my trips there, uh, uh, the, everyone from the person driving the bus to the Politburo member hammered away on those two themes. Our state-directed democracy is superior to your fuzzy, whatever that kind of democracy is that you have, and our state-directed capitalism, which has produced growth rates of 12%, 8%, 10%, is superior to your market-driven capitalism, and we will beat you on both those fronts. And, and they are making yards on that internationally. And so I, I think there's leadership needed in the Western world. Hopefully Canada could provide some of it to counter that, which means strengthening our version of democracy and strengthening our practice of market-based capitalism.
Do you think the CCP and its machination, so to speak, d- does pose an economic threat to Canada? Or do you think that the deficiencies of their system will eventually manifest themselves once they, I mean, it's easy to, to have growth rates of 10% when you're starting from zero, essentially. And so. Well, I, I, I personally believe that, that there are fundamental weaknesses in that state directed everything. On that subject, like the, the last time I went to China, I went after I was out of the parliament. I knew some of these people in the international liaison department. I said, because I, I was on this theme of training our politicians. I said, I want to visit three of your main training facilities for Communist Party officials. I didn't know if they agreed or not. But sure, they said, sure. So I went and I visited three of these complexes for training Communist Party officials. And they are impressive. Now, of course, you've got to attend. <laughs> you don't have an option of not attending. So that, But they offered five major courses. One of the major ones was military, still today, 20% military. Uh, to, to rise to the top, you have to serve in uh, several different districts. You can't just spend your entire political life in one district. You had to be, if you wanted to get to the national level, you had to serve in different districts. Uh, you, you had to serve at different levels, municipal or state, provincial, before you could get to the national. You had to come back uh, for every five years for a six-month refresher course at these uh, training facilities, which are like university campuses with buildings and training facilities, think tanks, uh, and uh, very, very frighteningly impressive when you compared it with our haphazard way of preparing people for public life. And at one of these think tanks, one of these campuses, there was a, I had a meeting with a scholar from one of their think tanks. And I asked him this convoluted question. I wasn't sure it was even getting through because it was done through translation, although a lot of those people speak English too, but they use the translation to give them time to think. So I said, uh, in the days of the Roman Empire, because they, they like history, they'll talk history, I said, suppose the leaders of the Roman Empire, the Caesars, had got together and had a strategic meeting to uh, figure out, is there any threat to our regime? Is there anybody that could ever replace us, as inconceivable as that is? Uh, and somebody might say, well, you got to watch those Persians in the East. You know, there could be a revival of the Persian Empire. you got to watch those. And someone else might say, well, we got to watch those northern barbarians. You know, they're getting pretty aggressive, and they could march down the roads that we built right into Rome. And somebody else might say, we may have an internal problem. We've got all these slaves and disenfranchised people, but nobody would have ever guessed that there was an obscure little sect in a backwater of the Roman Empire in Judea, uh, that there was a guy in a carpenter shop and a group of 12 people, that his idea and his followers would someday Constantine, a Christian guy, would sit on the throne of Rome and turn it into the Holy Roman Empire. You would never have thought of that. So I, I get this 10 minute. <laughs> so I asked this scholar, could it possibly be that it's somewhere in some backwater in China that nobody's thinking about or paying it? There's some idea or some group that could actually replace the Communist Party. So he, he doesn't answer right away because there's a Communist Party official in the room. We got to be a little bit careful of this. And and what he did say though surprised me. He says the environmental movement, and that he hastily said that what we understand that he said these young people are very much concerned about this, and but we understand that and we're we're going to deal with that. We're going to head it off in the. Passive. Right. Well, that goes along with people like Bjorn Lomberg's supposition that once people hit a certain standard of living, they start to become radically concerned with broader environmental issues. But they're no longer yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. desperate to feed themselves and they can, they can look at the quality, the broader quality of their environment. Yeah. yeah. But I was very surprised at that. And again, again, it shows that we're competing. Maybe that's another front you're going to end up competing with them on. They're going to try to demonstrate that citizen-directed democracy and citizen-directed capitalism can respond more quickly and better to the environmental challenge than your system. So all of this suggests the need to pull up the socks. So I, I kind of end up, I'm, I'm supposed to be retired and writing and doing some consulting on this, but I, I end up, my, my deepest beliefs is that Canada could be, there is a better Canada than what we got now. 
that Canada can be, and that requires recognizing the distinctiveness and the current concerns and aspirations of Western Canada as a part of Canada, that Canada can be better governed as a democracy, and there's things that can be done to strengthen their democracy, that conservatives can make a bigger and better contribution to that Canada of the future and that uh, better democracy, and that people of faith can make a bigger and better contribution if they conduct themselves wisely and graciously. That would probably be my summary statement of belief. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's a really good place to stop. Yes. Okay. Well, I yeah, very much enjoyed this, Jordan. I hope it's of some interest and use to your, uh, to your, your audience. Yeah, well, I, I, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. And it's, I, I'd very much like to thank you for taking the time to do this. I, I have one final question, I okay. guess. Do you know if, I know Pierre Poliver is using YouTube and some of the new communication techniques to his okay. great advantage. Do you, is there any recognition among the conservatives, let's say, that while well, YouTube, which is the biggest television network that's ever existed by a huge margin and has almost no costs for utilization, let's say. Is there any understanding that there is the possibility of communicating directly with constituents and even bypassing the media in some sense? Oh, I, I, think, there, I think there is. I'm not that close to the sort of the federal party's communications effort, but Pierre it would be very much, he, he's a very articulate uh, uh, and, and with it, the member of parliament. He was a high school student when he was on my bo constituency board in Calgary, Southwest. He's had an again. He's had a long interview. If you were a scout, if you were a scout scouting the arenas, you would have seen Pierre as this is a fellow that's got something to contribute. And uh, yeah, I'll one, be talking with him soon on this show. Oh yes, well he would be very good. But my one worry with the 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 people that one reaches, and I'm not not in any way trying to insult your audience, but with a lot of the younger people, I worry sometimes about substitute tooting discussion, blogging, tweeting, commentating for actually doing something. That, that's why I t entitled that book of mine, Doing Something. I, I, I've seen some of these younger political people that get into a, vir again, it's this virtual politics, and they get into a virtual loop. They, they, they talk about the issue, they blog about it, they tweet about it. But when I ask them, did you do anything? Like, did you did you go and write to your member of parliament? Did you call anybody? Did you attend something? Did you consider running for office? I tend to get a blank, and and I, I think uh, the, the more this what the enormous work can be done in that virtual arena, but the more it can be pushed into. Okay, we've discussed this. We've talked about it. What are we going to do about it? Uh, I used to tend to end uh, my meetings, so sometimes quite antagonistically almost with an office. Like, I didn't come here to this meeting in wherever. I didn't come here just to entertain you or to tell you stories. I came here because we want to elect somebody to change this. And if you're just here to listen to me or to have jokes or have coffee afterwards, uh, that's a, this is not the place for you. Are you prepared? To do? I used to push people hard uh, on that because it's a little bit easy in our system to substitute the discussion for action right so how do you tie the discussion and and even the discussion with the public to to concrete maneuvers within the existing political system that will make change well, 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 yeah by giving them a little list of some things they they can do uh like if, if I, I was at a meeting where they're discussing this balance between health protection measures on covid and uh, and uh, the protection of your rights and responsibilities under the constitution. You know, have, if, if you're concerned about your, your limitations on your rights and, and freedoms, have you, have you written to the attorney general? Have you called the justice minister's office? Have you done, have you talked to your MP to register that uh, concern? Have you, you know, if you've done something? And often just a little thing starts to trigger something. Have you gone to a meeting of other people that are doing this? Have you, here's three think tanks that are doing some work in this area. They desperately need money and more contacts. And can you contact any one of them? Just getting some little action like that usually leads to something else, if the person's action-oriented. So is that, are those things detailed out in your book? 
because okay, I think yeah. people don't know these action steps. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. On both the Democratic front, which is relevant to you, don't have to be a conservative. I, I say to everybody, we're all small D Democrats and we're all Canadians here in our political arena. So that we have in common. So these measures to strengthen democracy are in everybody's advantage. And then I've got an, another section that deals with just strengthening conservatism, if that's your orientation. Yeah, do something, do something. <laughs> Well, thank you very much again. Thank you, Jordan. Being, it was a pleasure seeing you. Let's keep in touch. Yes, definitely. Okay, bye-bye.